Coming up on Dr. Kiki's Science Hour, we're talking about biodiversity with Kevin Zelmio from DeepSeaNews.com. That's up next on Dr. Kiki's Science Hour. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Dr. Kiki's Science Hour is provided by CashFly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Dr. Kiki's Science Hour with me, Dr. Kiki Sanford. Episode 127, recorded Thursday, January 5th, 2012. The Biodiverse Universe. This episode of Dr. Kiki's Science Hour is brought to you by Netflix. Watch thousands of TV episodes and movies on your PC, Mac, iPad, iPhone, or TV instantly. All streamed directly to you, saving you time, money, and hassle. For your free 30-day trial, go to netflix.com slash twit. Welcome everyone to Dr. Kiki Science Hour. I'm Dr. Kiki and this is the hour of science. That's right, a whole hour where you get to find out about the world around you dig deeply into some topic in the subjects, uh, in the sciences for the entire hour with an expert in the subject matter. How often does that happen in your world? Probably not often enough, and so that's why you've got the science hour. This week, I hope you're ready to dig in. I hope you're always ready because it's time to get dirty. We're going to dig deep into the subject of biodiversity. What is it? Who cares and why should you care? That's some of, those are some of the questions that we're interested in answering today. And I will be speaking with scientist and science writer, Kevin Zelnio from deepseanews.com. But first, a few science headlines. This week in science news, the SpaceX Dragon capsule will launch February 7th. And if all goes well, dock with the International Space Station within the following three days. Space station astronauts are anticipating the arrival of this supply vehicle with excitement. Publishing in the journal Physical Review Letters, physicist Shmuel Nusinov and others from Tel Aviv University in Israel poke another hole in the faster than light neutrino story. Their take is that for neutrinos to be faster than light, it would violate not only relativity, but also the first law of thermodynamics, conservation of energy. Says Nusinov, I would have loved to have the result be true, but it's just inconsistent with basic, basic things. The only way to avoid this thing is to assume that, well, maybe on the, on the way they went to other dimensions or something. New research finds that schizophrenia might be the result of what are called epigenetic effects or control factors that reside outside of the genome. These factors are often more susceptible to environmental influence than genes themselves and have been associated with Huntington's disease, Parkinson's disease, and drug addiction. The findings suggest that pharmaceutical drugs could be tailored to address the neural disorder with significantly fewer side effects. Your babbling baby and my screaming baby out there probably isn't listening to himself babble. A current study in current biology found that two-year-olds did not try to correct their speech when it was mispronounced, but four-year-olds and adults did. The question now is to what is your teetering toddler actually listening? A new trigger for the spread of breast cancer has been discovered by Louisiana State Re University Health Sciences Center researchers providing a possible target for future treatments. The scientists found that a cell defense pathway called ISG15 turns on the cell cytoskeleton, turns on the cell cytoskeleton, damaging it and increasing the likelihood that the cancer will spread. Deep brain stimulation, or DBS, helps people suffering from major depression, bipolar, and manic depressive disorders. In the first ever placebo-controlled trial of DBS, the symptoms of depression were reversed in most patients and the improvements maintained for over two years. If electrode stimulation was stopped at any point, all the symptoms returned. More clinical trials are currently underway in Europe and North America. 
incredibly cute Reese's monkey chimeras, the first primate chimeras ever, were introduced to the world this week. Named Chimera, Roku, and Hex, the infant's cells are made up of the genetic material of up to six Rhesus monkey embryos. All monkeys are biologically male, but Hex has both male and female cells. Chimeras like these are important for the discovery of more information about embryo formation and understanding the potential of stem cell, stem cell therapies. The first hybrid shark species ever described was found in Australian waters. The fact that the separate Australian black tip and common black tip shark species have mated to create a robust hybrid has implications for global shark populations if this is an adaptation to allow species expansion into cooler waters. Scientists publishing in PLOS Biology found communities of unknown species clustered around undersea vents called black smokers near Antarctica. The glimpse of hydrothermal vent ecosystems suggests a global diversity richer than previously imagined. That does it for the stories this week. Now for a word from our sponsor, Netflix. Netflix, this episode of Dr. Kiki's Science Hour is brought to you by Netflix. Netflix streams thousands of TV episodes and movies directly to you instantly, which means you save time, money, and hassle. There are several ways to instantly access streaming movies and TV shows uh, with Netflix. You can watch Netflix movies and shows on your Mac, your PC, your iPad, there's an iPad app, or your iPhone, and some Android phones as well. If you have gaming consoles like the Xbox 360, PS3, or Nintendo Wii, you can watch Nintendo right on your Nintendo. You can watch Netflix right on your TV. If you're not a gamer, and you have something like a set-top box, a Roku box, an Apple TV. You can watch Netflix on your TV with one of these inexpensive, easy-to-use devices. With Netflix, you can watch movies and TV shows instantly using any of these different devices. And you can start watching a show or a movie on one device, stop at any point you have to, and then pick up where you left off, left off on a, any other device. Makes it very easy to watch the shows that, that, you, that you want. Whichever way you choose to access Netflix, you can watch as many movies and shows as you want, any time you want, and you can cancel at any time. Try Netflix today for 30 days free. Go to netflix.com slash twit. Be sure to use this URL when you sign up for your free trial. It's netflix.com slash twit. We thank Netflix for their support of twit and Dr. Kiki Science Hour and hope that you enjoy watching instantly with Netflix. Now, back to the show. We're getting biodiverse today, and our guest today is Kevin Zelnio. He's a marine biologist by training and now a freelance science writer, independent scientist, and science communications strategist living in the beautiful coastal northern North Carolina. He has studied the ecology and evolution of animals living around underwater volcanoes and described several new species of deep sea invertebrates. Kevin is the assistant editor for Deep Sea News, where he contributes articles on marine science. Outside of science, Kevin is a songwriter and enjoys spending time with family in the Longleaf Carolina Pines. And very soon, he's going to be moving to Sweden. That's some exciting news, Kevin. Well, thank you for joining us on the show today. Thank you. It's my pleasure to be here. You're welcome. Now, the, the reason I was excited about getting you on the show is you wrote a, a post for Scientific American in the, um, the, the Evo Eco Lab blog home. And your post uh, from yesterday was on the misuse of messaging in biodiversity loss prevention. And I, I, I read the article and it just was just fascinating to me, the idea of um, how we can use language to get people maybe more interested in biodiversity and how we can get them to act on act on things. But um, before we really dig into the issue of communicating it, what is biodiversity? Where do we start? Well, that's a that's a good question. Uh, um, you would think it'd just be an easy answer, like, you know, biodiversity is the diversity of life, which I think that's the definition we should probably all use. Um, it's nice, it's simple, and it's uh, fair to all the taxa that are out there. Um, but a lot of uh, the definitions of biodiversity have been sort of chaotic and, 
And some are, are defined by not just how many species there are, but how evenly distributed the numbers of individual species are in ecosystems. Um, some of them are, are defined by um, the numbers of plants and animals, which leaves out things like fungus, bacteria, and protists, all these other animals, which are um, sometimes even more abundant and certainly just as important to the ecosystems. Um, so there's a lot of a mixed definitions of biodiversity. I think most people probably mean the diversity of life. Most people believe basically come down to the diversity of life itself. Let's see, I like the I like the simple the simple answer. But are there in in the fact that there is kind of a a difficulty in pinning it down? Does that make um, make talking about it and talking about what it is and why it's important? difficult i think it does because well first of all when you talk about the diversity of life there's a lot of things about life right there's there's animals there's plants but there's also um, cells there's single celled organisms there's genes um, there's viruses there's all these components and then there's ecosystems which have tons and tons of species um, so it's hard to talk about what exactly is life um, when we don't really agree on that? And then if we talk about, well, let's just say, let's just say yeah. um, that there's we, the diversity of species. Well, there's currently something like 30 different concepts of what a species is. So there's no agreed on definition. And so when you, when you have these sort of infighting about uh, what is and what is not a species or what is what isn't life, it makes it really hard for the public to get a grasp on what scientists are talking about. And this is very problematic in communicating the idea of biodiversity. Um, it's probably not the most problematic thing, most problematic thing is probably getting people just to care in general. Right. <laughs> but um, but this is a, this is a, a very fundamental issue, um, is trying to just grasp um, or at least to tell the public that there is, it's okay that science doesn't know something or disagrees about something because they, they, they take that disagreement and then they shift it over into something in their mind that says, well, scientists don't really know what they're talking about. And that's what bothers right. me. And that's the exact, that's absolutely what we don't want. You don't want yeah. people to think that scientists have no idea what they're talking about when in fact they have a very, very strong hold on on the subject they study and they understand a lot about it. But there are these, uh, in science, it's uh, there are things that we don't understand yet. That's just inherent in it. That's exactly, that's just part of the scientific process. And people just don't know what the scientific process really is, you know? And so we need, to, everybody needs to do just a better job of communicating what that is, what the process of discovery is, of testing, of multiple lines of evidence, of falsifiability. But you can't use those kinds of words, really. But you have to somehow uh, relay those concepts. Yeah, I like thinking of um, uh, relating things to my my infant son. So I think of him as a little scientist because he tries things over and over and over again. You know, <laughs> taking the door and shutting it and opening it and shutting it and opening it and shutting it and opening it. It's like... It makes a noise. Really? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you have to do that over again, but he's replicating. He's replicating experiences and that's, you know, mm -hmm. that's one aspect of, is, of, of exactly the scientific it. method. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, so with the 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 points on, on communicating biodiversity that, that you were that you made in in your article let's kind of go I'd love to go through um, some of the I guess the problems and, and the big question is you, you brought it up was why should people care you know first you have to figure out you know why should people care and then try and get them to care right right so I think you know in the United States at least uh, there's the people that care and they're already, they're off, they're fine. You know, those are the soldiers. Those are the people that we don't need to cater to. But then there's the people that don't care, or at least we think don't care. And those are the people that we want to um, uh, get the messages across. Now, the hard part is finding out what those messages are. And I got interested in this because um, I, I, get, I get so tired of hearing about the negativity 
and the doom and the gloom stories. As an ecologist, this it's all you ever hear. It's all people publish. It's all the the media just runs with it all the time. It gets very tiring and exhausting here, especially when you know that there's success stories out there and there's some fantastic success stories. Um, the marine reserve system has has is all those studies, all those reserves that were. Uh, set down in like the 80s and then in the 90s we're starting to get the data back from all that right we had to wait for for populations to recover now we're getting the data from that and we're showing that there's some great things happening um, that animals biodiversity is increasing populations are healthier um, there's a spillover effect which is a huge important thing I think uh, your guest last week David Guggenheim, mm -hmm. uh, Guggenheim rather uh, um, yeah uh, mentioned this as well, whereas as uh, the populations that are doing fantastic in reserves go out and they leave the reserve, right? So um, fishermen actually get more fish or lobstermen get more lobsters in the case of some right. of the UK reserves. Um, so there's a lot of good things going on. Um, the, one of the ones that I tried to focus on in my article was this idea of ecosystem services. Um, and that's just one, I think. I, I mean, there's probably more. I just can't think of them off the top of my head. Uh, mm -hmm. I was just writing this at night. It was kind of like, you know, ecosystem service, that just seems like something that really should have grasped. Uh, people should have gotten that. Um, and I don't feel like I don't feel like that has been grasped very well uh, mm -hmm. among the general public. Um, I mean, it, it, it's the world is providing a service for us because we're all part of this interconnected ecosystem. The problem is that people that uh, we've taken humans out of the ecosystem. When we're actually, we're still part of it, right? We're still affecting the ecosystem. It still affects right. us. So, right, but psychologically, um, psychologically, there's been, or, or culturally, there's been a separation. Exactly. Exactly. There's a cultural separation where we're viewed as something that's not a part of it. But that can't be true if we're, if we're going out and changing the landscape. Yeah. And when we do that, some of the research that has been done on this um, in the 90s, especially, and there's some more and there's some, been some more, of course, since then, um, has shown that uh, if you evaluate the services that those ecosystems provided when they when they were intact, that they actually uh, are often more than the resources that we extracted from those ecosystems. For an example, take a forest. Uh, an old growth timber forest anywhere in the world. Let's just say North Carolina is where I live. Um, if we take a North Carolina Appalachian forest, clear off a hectare of it, and the value that we would have gotten from the timber, from the pulp, um, the jobs that were created in the timber industry, um, all those types of things that go into into it, that that sort of economic value um, doesn't necessarily replace the value we've we got from the trees, the tree roots holding in the soil, um, keeping landscape, landslides from happening on people's homes on the mountainsides, uh, mm -hmm. the air quality effects of it, the um, homes it provided for animals that were hunted or for, for recreational bird watchers or something like that, you know, recreational value of that, of the hectare of, of forest. So there's all these sorts of, um, uh, unseen or kind of in the back of the mind services that we just don't think of that just happen and we don't even it just passes us by we don't even know <laughs> right and so when you start looking at uh, questions of areas what should they be conserved are they you know is, is the biodiversity in an area important for conservation uh, should you allow a mine to go in or should you allow a logging operation to occur? Should, should we allow um, fishing to occur in a particular area? You know, when you, right. when you determine whether a human activity should be allowed to take place, these, uh, these kinds of ecosystem services would necessarily need to be taken into, into account, right? I, I think that they should. And I think this is what we're seeing with this sort of a movement of um, ecotourism around the world, I think mm -hmm. um, I had the I had the um, fortune to visit uh, one in Fiji. I did my master's degree work in, in Fiji, um, um, unfortunately. Unfortunately. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. So I, I took a, a little a, bit of the tan. <laughs> <laughs> I 
<laughs> that was a long time ago. But yeah. um, the I visited, took some time off usually before my expeditions. And uh, I would just hike around with a backpack on and around Fiji and, and get to know the people and had a great time. And uh, I visited an ecotourism project in, in the, uh, on the, the main island, B, uh, B2 Levu, I think it is. And um, they uh, had a community that um, chose to, to save their, their land on the, on the, on the side of a, a mountain, basically. And uh, provide two um, guide services um, and they still farmed uh, with uh, within the um, the landscape itself more like foraging but they, they still kind of farmed a little bit too um, and they and they provided all this kind of tourist uh, service because that the value that they got from people like me coming in there and having no problem spending you know 10 or 20 bucks for a guide or for just the entrance fee to the to the park mm-hmm. um, uh, and, and, and coming in and sharing uh, sharing some uh, oranges and some fruit and, and drinks, tea and stuff with them, uh, you know, the value they got from that was much greater than losing their home. So I mean, if, if, if a company comes in to, to log it or to mine it, um, and then they lose their homes too, and they lose they lose their land, they lose their livelihoods. Um, so there's a lot that goes in place to get to keep all that. And plus get money on top of it, you know? (laughs) That's just one example. And I think there's lots of these examples out there, um, especially in Latin America and other Pacific Island countries as well. Yeah. There's going to, it seems as though there will have to be some kind of a balance made. Um, We, to maintain um, the biodiversity of the planet, countries and, and communities will have to consider they're the ecosystems that, that they have within their borders. They're going to have to consider what they want to conserve um, versus the needs of the people. So what mm-hmm. resources do you need? How are you going to get them? Um, you know, how do, how, do you, how do you see this kind of balancing playing out? Wow, that's, that's a really tough question um, <laughs> because when you get into multinational, it's multinational politics, and right. you try to get two, get one nation to agree on something um, within itself <laughs> is an impossible task. So um, the, the, that's why I think increasing the amount of messaging going on uh, and and targeting populations that are not getting the message, or, or at least, or maybe not understanding or not appreciating the messages. Um, targeting those populations is probably a better approach than doing really anything else because we want the people growing up now to carry that appreciation on with them throughout the rest of their lives to become professionals. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, to to do that, we need to we need to really involve them more, people more. I don't want more scientists. I can't even find a job. I don't want more scientists. I want more <laughs> people in in the public that appreciate science, that appreciate the value of science, that appreciate the, appreciate the, uh, the, uh, the biodiversity and the services that the planet provides us. Um, that we, and it doesn't ask for anything in return, right? So right. Um, I want, we, we need to get those people on, on board. And um, so forget about the dinosaurs. Let the dinosaurs die out and let the up-and-coming people Fill that fill that niche with with a hopefully more improved knowledge, um, but getting there is the hard part, right? Okay, we can right. say we want better this and better that, but the fact of the matter is we need to actually go out and engage these people, which is not what we're doing. Yeah, going out and actually getting the people. So um, <clears throat> here in the United States, and I don't know whether this is something that's international or not, but there was a an environment. There is an environmental movement that that came out of the the 70s and um it kind of has a bad rap that there you know people who are um a bit uh um that people people who are uh, extreme in their methods that they you know won't listen to compromise and to, to say that you're an environmentalist you know is not necessarily something that's going to win people onto your side so um with what you've been looking at in terms of communicating and how to communicate messages to people, um, what what seems to be the the best way 
to start forming those messages so that you don't immediately get the, ah, you're an environmentalist, you don't know anything kind of response. Right. Environmentalist is a dirty word, and I don't use mm -hmm. it. I, I, I tell people I'm ecologist. Ecologists study the science um, of, uh, of, the, of, the, of the plant from a scientific point of view, not an, uh, an activism point of view. Although in reality, I'm, I'm a little bit of both. I think we all need to be. I think scientists do need to be active, activists in some respects. Um, they, are, they are activists in the fact that they go out and request millions of dollars to do their research. You know, so they have a, I mean, to pretend we're otherwise, it's, it's kind of, kind of uh, disingenuous. Um, to, to get them, if I understand the question right, you want to know um, how do we get the message to those, those people? Yeah. That, that's, there's a variety of ways to do that. I mean, uh, the, we really need to move away from a one-size-fits-all approach. And by, by us, I mean any journalist, scientist, media, anybody that's interested in promoting this message of improving biodiversity or preventing biodiversity loss, rather, uh, needs to, needs to get, get away from their medium and, and try new strategies. You know, for instance, I've been blogging for about five years now, and I've only pretty much done blogging. Uh, before that, before I even knew what a blog was, I was out and I was going to um, schools, talking to children, giving tours of my lab to school groups, things like that, being more engaging. Um, the online medium reaches a lot of people. It has, the, has a great potential. But it also only reaches people that are online. <laughs> so, yeah. um, you know, and as much as I love the online medium, and I feel like I get a lot out of it. I feel like, um, you know, the hit rates counters are going up and there's trends, to growth trends and everything like that in the blogs. But uh, there's more blogging, too. There's more scientists out there blogging. The fact of the matter is we still have this dichotomy um, going on on the planet. So the people who are interested find the blogs. But the mm -hmm. people who aren't interested or don't know they're interested aren't going out and searching for uh, what's going on in biodiversity on blogs or what's going on, on what's what's the latest Twitter on biodiversity. Um, I, I would love for them to do that, but the fact of the matter is they, they're not. So we need to actually um, not get involved so much in the tools and get more involved in pinpointing where we need to go in. The broadcast method uh, is great because it's easy, it's low-hanging fruit. You can write something, you can put it out there, you can use SEO um, strategies to, to get it into Google, higher Google rank algorithms or whatever. Right. Um, but, but like I said, you only get into people that are already online, that are already reading blogs, or people who are doing Google searches. You know, most of my traffic actually comes from Google searches. <laughs> yeah. So I want to uh, play, there was a, a, a trailer that you put on your, uh, on your <laughs> article from the movie The Call of Life. It's a documentary that was produced by The Video Project. And I've actually worked with them, a great group oh. of people who do a lot of great environmental uh, uh, programming. And so I just want, I want to play the, the trailer or, and I want to talk about the message and how that message uh, gets is is be is received and who the audience is. Okay. okay. There's a mass extinction occurring on the planet today. There has never been anything like this in human history. You know, humans have never seen anything like this. In many ways, it's the biggest crisis since we came out of our caves 10,000 years ago, no less. The last recorded truly mass extinction was about 65 million years ago, and we're now starting into another mass extinction, except this time it's not an asteroid, it's our own species, Homo sapiens, that's doing the job. Our estimates of how many will be lost if we're on this path are pretty good, and they're really big numbers. We may well lose half of the world's biological diversity. The space aliens were doing what this culture is doing. If aliens came down from outer space and they were vacuuming the oceans, 90% of the large fish in the oceans are gone. 90% if they were changing our genetic structure with phthalates and they were changing the climate, we would fight back. 
During the last 50 years while I've been involved in conservation, I've noticed that the amount of money going into conservation has increased, let's say, five times over. And the amount of scientific understanding we've got has increased five times over. The number of citizens involved in this game increased five times over. And yet, our cause is still going down the tubes. And the mass extinction is gathering place more, more than ever. So, so what's going wrong? We need to attack the root causes of our problems. In our quest to live a good life, we're wiping out the very foundations of our well-being. Denial is a word that actually refers to quite a few different processes. And our um, denial of the environmental damage that we're doing probably includes all of these different processes in one way or another. Preventing extinction is, is a, going to be a big challenge for human society, but it's certainly one that we're capable of doing. Something is birthing now. An awareness is coming to us that is totally fresh. We have to begin the process of reinventing what it means to be human. This is something that we have to do now. It's not something that we can postpone to our children or our grandchildren. It's up to us. This is a responsibility that our generation has uniquely. So I've, uh, I've actually watched this movie and the, um, the trailer is pretty true to the, the movie itself. It's, there's a lot of ah, doom and gloom and everything is terrible. Like it, it makes it, I, I, I couldn't, I, by the end I was just like, oh, I'm so right. depressed. <laughs> Do you want to leave an, um, an experience like that depressed? Is that going to motivate you to do something about it? No, I wanted to, I wanted to, I mean, I, I wanted to Probably do something wanted to, about like, it. wanted to like drink a hot chocolate and curl up by a fire and cry. And cry, <laughs> exactly. I was like, can I just, can I, can Yeah, I so that's the message, that's the environmentalist world? strategy that's been going on for a long time. Um, I mean, I, I don't know, I've only been doing this for 10 or 15 years, but that's about, that's the message that's been going on since I've been paying attention. <laughs> Anyways, I'm sure it's right. been going on longer than that. Uh, right off the bat, you come. They go right off the horse case with a negative image. This is bad. Things are happening. There's death. There's destruction. There's fires, and there's like a person being burned or something. And there's uh, uh, there's a um, and they they bring up aliens. And uh, as soon as you you do something like that, that just seems kind of preposterous. Like if aliens came here. You've already lost the people you, you, that are are going to um, that that might be on the fence, you know, and are kind of leaning towards the other side of caring. They're like, oh, these scientists are bringing up aliens, you know. What, what the hell? This isn't the contact movie or whatever. This is this is life. This is real life. If I'm just coming home from a hard day of working, you know, I've been smell like crap from doing plumbing all day and working at a factory or flipping burgers or whatever it is you're doing. If you're, a, if you're a regular person, that's not a scientist. That's not technologically inclined, which is a great proportion of this country still. Um, then you're probably not going to get these messages. You're probably going to turn it off or change it. It's probably not that interesting to you because that's not the life that you're living. You already have enough doom and gloom in your own life. Uh, I'm not saying everybody's life is horrible. I'm just saying that there's a lot of things going on um, that you probably just don't uh, appreciate that sort of message. Uh, one of the other things that that um, I find interesting is in these documentaries is that there's always an appeal to authority. Um, so there's a, the big old white guy usually I had a white girl in there too, but big and old authority person telling us how we should do something. And that's a message that doesn't resonate with a lot of people, surprisingly. Um, it does resonate with several people, uh, types of people. Um, but I think if you're, if you're on the fence and you're leaning towards the other side, I think that's probably going to turn you off a lot. Why not get somebody else in there, like some uh, young, fresher person uh, that looks like them, looks like the people who you want to target? 
um, maybe uh, uh, youth in their 25 to 35 age frame, you know, that's the, actually the, the, I mean, sorry, yeah, that's the actual age range that we're losing people at, is just 25 to say 35 or 45, because mm -hmm. uh, they have so much going on in their lives, they can't be bothered with these sorts of issues. They're worried about their, their own economy, much less worried about the economy of the planet. So uh, I think it's, I think messages like that are missing. What they do is they strengthen the choir. So they preach the choir and they strengthen that sector people. Um, and I mentioned this in my article that uh, there's some psych psychological research that I found, some social psychology that showed that, um, that uh, people are more likely to um, uh, appeal to negative um, message frames if their peers are uh, um, supportive of the issue. Does that make sense? Right. So if, they, if, if their peers, their friends, their family mm -hmm. were supportive of it, then they would be too. Right. Be and, then the, to it. and then the vice, the vice versa is true. So if, if they're in an environment where the people are not um, supportive of the issue, say of biodiversity loss, um, then positive messaging, message framing actually appeals to them more. So they're more likely to do something um, if they have positive messages. So and positive so for, messages would be like, you can do something, you can make a change, you are, uh, you, you are a part of the solution, something. Yeah, there. It's. It's. I think it's. Yeah, it's more like. Um, like it's. It's a. It's a good thing to do. It's a responsible thing to do. Um, it's considerate to do this. That kind of a. That kind of a frame. Um, you know, you're doing this for your yourself, um, mm -hmm. and it benefits you somehow. Um, a negative frame would be would be the opposite. That um, if you don't do this, you're being selfish. You're being careless. Um, you are you are irresponsible. There's something wrong with you. You need to fix yourself. So I mean that that's all. That's as someone like me who's all who's a very rebellious teenager. Um, that that would that would uh, still makes me kind of rebellious. I'm like, who the who the hell are you to tell me what to do? You know, right. I don't need some <laughs> old scientist guy telling me what to do. <laughs> so I, I think some that's environmentalists telling me that I need to do turn off the lights to save the planet. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So that, and that's where we're at. Um, and that we've been stuck there. I feel like we've been stuck there for a really long time. It's time to change something. And I don't know the answer, but I think we should experiment. I think we should, tr should try new things. And so I brought up the idea of, you know, well, maybe, maybe you, ecosystem services is actually a positive frame. And if we really want to get the the people who have a negative view of the issue, um, then we should we should try doing something in a positive message frame, so that they can relate to it more. If this idea of that these like, these social psychologists call this deviance regulation, if this idea is actually true, if it holds, um, then that's what we would expect. We expect them to appeal to the positive message frame, um, so we can tell them, hey, you're saving money. Um, by supporting this issue, you're you're uh, uh, making the planet a better place um, for yourself. You know, maybe you like to hunt. You're making a nice environment for deer and pheasant, or whatever you mm -hmm. like to hunt. Um, you know, maybe you like to bird watch. You know, conservative okay. people uh, in general aren't aren't against the environment. Uh, Laura Bush has been a, a staunch proponent of the environment. She's been out there advocating for the Gulf of Mexico. But in a way that makes sense to conservatives, in a way that um, that combines industry and combine uh, with with uh, ecology, with economy. saving yeah. the planet and economy, right? So yeah. combining these all these issues, and I think that's the that compromise that environmentalists have to make. Right. So the the one message that has been for, used for the last forty or so years um, needs to needs to shift and maybe. Well, I mean, if something doesn't work, do we just keep doing it. Yeah. If something no. doesn't work, we try something else. Try so something let's else. try something else. <laughs> That's, That's all what I'm you do saying. In science, right? Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> we had the repetition. The hypothesis was rejected. 
<laughs> I like that. Um, in terms of putting putting some of this uh, in into practice, there were uh, a couple of stories that I picked for the new the news headlines at the beginning of the hour um, that are also maybe close to home for you. Um, published in PLOS Biology, that there are a bunch of unknown species around Antarctic vents, hydrothermal vents. Um, and they're, and they're really rich, diverse ecosystems. These hydrothermal vents are also very rich in metals and are uh, really being looked at by the mining industry, not necessarily these particular vents in Antarctica, uh, but around the world. So when we, uh, we start seeing the biodiversity and then versus the industry, here we have you know, a place where maybe this messaging can be used, put to use in it, in somehow. I I agree, and the when it comes to the deep sea mining issue, which is, um, I, 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 so everybody knows, I've worked in the uh, deep sea hydrothermal vent ecology field for a number of years now, and published a lot of papers in it, um, and I've even worked um, on some of the environmental impacts of um, funded research from from a mining company. So I have to just dis disclose that. Um, and so uh, I'm definitely uh, in tune with this issue. The, the fact of the matter is they're going to go and do it no matter what. We can, but what we can do as scientists is make sure that it's done in, a, in the best environmentally sustainable way possible. And I, and I, and I, think, and I think that that's a hard message for a lot of scientists to appreciate it because they, uh, especially environmentalists, but, but we don't control who gets, who gets to uh, mine what areas. The governments do. They, they lease, the, lease the areas for mining. So what I would hope to do as a scientist is um, do the best science possible and with the, the, the best highest end that I can, <laughs> the best statistics, um, to to uh, make sure um, that they are going to be mining in a a way that diminishes the biodiversity loss. Hydrothermal vents are interesting from another perspective because they are um, short-lived ephemeral habitats. So uh, if you're going to mine any habitat, I hate to say this almost, but um, I'm going to just just throw it out there that it's probably one of the the better habitats to mine as long as it's not done in a, a raise and destroy kind of a way. <laughs> right, right. So there, I, as long as there are other other possible methods, I mean, I think when I when I imagine mining, all I imagine are, you know, deep pits dug in the ground that you see above above ground. It's yeah, it's really hard to say because uh, it hasn't been done before. This is a test case that we're living in right now. Um, and it's not exactly like uh, strip mining on the top. It is in many respects, except that you don't have to remove a bunch of trees. You remove a bunch of animals <laughs> that, are, that, that right. are laying on top of it. Um, but uh, you don't have to dig down. It's all laying on the top of the, of the seafloor. Um, so the, it's, it's, it's similar, but it's different. The, 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 the problem that's really going on with mining is the way that the governments and the mining companies are handling, the, are handling it politically, more or less. Um, there's not a lot of benefits going from, from the mining going back to the people that are affected by it. So that's right. a, social, a social political problem, not a scientific problem, unfortunately. Yeah, right. That's more. Yeah. <laughs> That's a different group of people who worry about that issue. <laughs> well, I worry about it, but as a, as a writer and a, as someone who's, you know, deeply in love with the, the deep sea ecosystem, um, I got my start in, in hydrothermal vent biology, and, uh, and so I, I feel a, a deep passion towards it. The new stuff that's being discovered right now by uh, the, the, the British group that was just published, the Pulse paper, um, um, is, is absolutely fascinating discoveries you know these we we have so much to know learn still about biodiversity the there's some ridiculous amount of mileage of of mid-ocean ridge out there like eighty thousand. i think it was i calculated once it wasn't a paper i wrote I can't remember the name the amount right now but i think it's about 60 or eighty thousand, somewhere in between there my uh, kilometers rather of uh, of uh, mid-ocean ridge and there's not any reason why any of that doesn't have life on it 
And we can only access um, a certain portion of those mid-ocean ridges. And there's other hot spots and, and back arc basins and, and things like that. So uh, we can only access, get to a certain amount of it. In Atlanta, we're seeing very different patterns. And uh, so um, we have this conundrum where because it's such a, a nutritionally rich environment that um, the biodiversity tends to be low. So people kind of discount a little, a little bit, which is, which is actually a, a really uh, the wrong way of looking at it. The, way, the, the right way of looking at it is, is that we have a very specialized fauna existing in this uh, environment. And that's not found anywhere else. So it's a very endemic fauna. It's one of the highest endemicities of any type of environment. And endemicity means that the the organism is only found, or the species is only found in this type of a habitat or this location. Right. Um, it's like so, it's like species being found in the rainforest, and you only find them yeah, in. It's only there. You know. Yeah. Only in the rainforest that so we're yep. on Madagascar or something. Yeah, you only find some animals at coral reefs, or only find some animals in deserts, or we only find some animals on North America, you know, so right. on and so forth. So endemicity is very high at hydrothermal vents, which is the one. This is one thing that has has going for it. And the animals, of course, are 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 just absolutely fascinating. And uh, we've made many dis far wide ranging discoveries that I can't even uh, imagine. So me medical discoveries, um, with the en an enzyme that we can use uh, from thermophilic mm -hmm. animal or bacteria that uh, we can use in genetics. And there's just all sorts of all sorts of amazing things that we've been finding from it. So it's a very knowledge rich environment. And when my main what I mean by that, it's an environment that that were, uh, has a high return um, of yeah. knowledge for discovery. I wonder, it's, uh, when we, when I'm just thinking of in terms of biodiversity and conservation, when, you're, uh, when we think about something like the rainforest, it's so visual and it's the, you know, the clearing of the rainforests. It's having an effect on the atmosphere. It's having an, a, an effect on the soil. It's, um, you know, we're losing species as a result of it. You know, these are all very tangible results that that we can talk about in terms of something like a hydrothermal vent where we're just starting to you know we've got the tip of the iceberg yeah. when it comes to understanding that or or having an idea of the diversity that's that's on the uh, the vents in the vent ecosystems it's you know it, it, do you think this is a is it going to be some kind of a you know if we start damaging these vents too much it's it will it be like the rainforests yeah well yeah, Am I well, I think if you if you do no, I don't think it's a stretch. Um, we're, I, we're, we're, we're this is like if, this is like imagine we just discovered the Amazon rainforest, right? Um, and in the modern area, pretend like none of that discovery from the Spanish and whatever happened. We just discovered the the forest, um, and we go in there. We're like, hey, there's a bunch of resources here we can extract. Um, you know, obviously that has a very detrimental and visible effect. With the deep sea, right now, the biggest stakeholders are actually scientists. Mm -hmm. um, and then we, I just wrote, we wrote a paper about this last year called Scientists as Stakeholders in Hydrothermal Vent Conservation that was published in Conservation Biology. And, and we looked and, and, and we, we saw how, what the impact of scientists are on vents right now. And it's a good test scenario for this. We compared it to we compared the amount of research being done on vents compared to coral reefs and seagrass beds to comparable marine environments um, that have a lot of research done on them. So um, the, the research, the trajectory of research is increasing at about the same rate in all three habitats. Mm. Um, but there's other things that affect coral reefs and that affect seagrass beds that don't affect um, um, the vent. hydrothermal vents because of their, lo their location, basically. So um, the mining is starting to come in right now, and that's the, that's the ultimate test case. Yeah. And that's, we just have to wait and, and, and see, and we have to, uh, I don't think fighting, uh, fighting it will do, is, is a waste of time, because they're gonna go in there because they're negotiating with governments, they're not negotiating with scientists. But we need to get in there and make sure that we, the right people are doing the environmental impact assessments and monitoring 
you know, yeah. which is one and thing I really the, respect. The gover that governments are actually making sure that there's money for environmental impact assessment, that there's well, actually... Or that the companies are, are putting aside money for environmental yeah. impact assessments. Setting the standard really high right now is what they're trying to do. Um, yeah. uh, and trying to make it so, uh, I, I, I think that the premier sort of mining company out there right now, if I won't name, is doing, is, is actually doing a, a fair job. It's really, it's really hard to criticize. I really want to, I really want to say <laughs> you guys are evil and I right. hate you. But, right. um, the fact of the matter is they're, they're, they are putting the money in and, uh, doing the assessments. Um, they're letting the scientists publish the work. You know, it's not it's not filtered. Um, so I think, so I think I think by that by that's a that this this might be a good test case also of uh, scientists, government, and industry working together. Um, this might be a case study that we can follow and follow up in ten years time or five years time, and um, say, okay, well, what did we do wrong? Where did we go? And how can we fix this for the future? I think that's a that. So we'll be talking again in 10, 15 years. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> see how, exactly. See what the follow-up. <laughs> yeah, the follow-up interview. No, hopefully we'll talk again much sooner than that. Um, <laughs> so uh, other stuff that you've been that you've been doing. This is I, I I love talking about the the deep sea vents and the and 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 the biodiversity and the issues surrounding that. Mm -hmm. But you're you're also involved generally in science communication. Um, uh, you you work uh, as Assistant editor at the Deep Sea News, deepseanews.com, mm -hmm. is that correct? And yes. um, and uh, additionally, you were part of a group that, um, and I'm blanking on the name of the group that you published it under, but you published a video on evolution that was yeah, that that hit the, the web. The scope group for scope science group. communication outreach projects <laughs> and education. <laughs> and <laughs> education. kind of something we just kind of put together, but uh, it's, right. it's sort of an informal group that we'd like to, of course, you know, make it more formal. But um, so yeah. the evolution video was our test test case. Um, I'd like to just shout out to my uh, colleagues, Andrea Kachuski, um, um, uh, Jamie Vernon, Matt Shipman, and, uh, and David. So uh, the, uh, what we, we, it started off actually as a collaboration sparked by a Twitter comment um, about the Miss USA pageant. They answered a question about should evolution be taught in schools? And um, of that, only two of the contestants, of the 50 contestants, um, had a positive uh, thing to say about evolution, meaning that they were yeah. supportive of it. The other 48 were uh, very no, negative. Miss and California. Yeah, Miss California, who ended up California winning, right? California was good. <laughs> <laughs> I can't remember who the other one was. Was it Connecticut or something? I think it something. was. Yeah. yeah. Uh, something not California. <laughs> yeah, every, every, all, all the other contestants, or many of the contestants, seem to go with the uh, teach the controversy type answer. Right. That's a know. sort of an easy way out and, yeah. um, and, and entirely not, not accurate way out. <laughs> so uh, we, we put the... We, we, we were talking about it on Twitter, kind of, uh, uh, just kind of like uh, sad about it, you know. And uh, uh, someone, I think maybe Matt, um, uh, said that you know we should we should put a positive message out there for evolution. And I'm sort of like, uh, yeah, that sounds, sounds like a good idea. We should do that. And so we started talking about it behind the scenes, and uh, uh, and we decided uh, to. Uh, uh, contact a bunch of people, and uh, it turned into um, that we were only going to use female role models um, for the speaker. Not not necessarily in a direct contradiction of the female role models by the, of the Miss USA, but because uh, we wanted to kind of hit two birds with a stone. We wanted to increase the visibility of uh, female scientists um, out there that are doing great work that that often mm -hmm. don't get their dues, and um, then we also wanted to. Uh, provide uh, a positive role models um, and in support of evolution, teaching evolution. Um, so we got a, a great bunch of, 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 uh, of PhD level um, scientists, um, some journalists and science writers. Um, so a lot of people. Um, yeah, we have, uh, if we can roll the video, I just want to play like the first first minute or so. Sure. Except 
preventing evolution doesn't mean abandoning your personal beliefs. Evolution is a change in population over time. Evolution is change in gene frequency. Evolution is about competition, okay? The most successful organisms, such as plants, animals, fungi, bacteria, survive to carry those traits that help them be successful into the next generation. Evolution is the unifying idea of biological and life sciences. It's what makes taxonomy, physiology, nutrition, and even our own human bodies make sense. Biology literally means the study of life. Evolution describes the process by which the life that surrounds us, the life that we see every day on our bodies and in our backyards, came to be. Evolution is not a theory. So it's just a, a taste of, of, of the of the uh, whole video. It's a, it's a bit longer than that. You um, covered a few questions about evolution, which um, wasn't one of the, uh, the last questions, should it be taught in schools? <laughs> which was the yeah. same question that was asked the, to the pageant, to the, to the yeah. pageant contestants. Right. So I wanted, yeah, we mean, I wanted to have just, well, the strategy, of course, is to provide a bunch of sound bites um, for editing. Um, uh, when we put together a video, we had a fantastic um, a video editor who, who wished to remain nameless. The but he was did a real knockout job um, in putting that together. But was, you have to appreciate how hard it was um, with uh, everybody doing their own videos and sending files um, by the internet and uh, uh, trying to match the sound qualities. Everybody has varying qualities, so um, I think he did a, he did a wonderful job. Uh, we're not sure if this was the right way to do it, but this is the way that we thought to do it at the time. And so we, we've been thinking a lot about how, um, uh, what we can do to improve that message. You know, we view this sort of thing as an experiment, and uh, we hope that uh, we can make um, more positive messages for other issues. Uh, we're thinking about the um, vaccination campaigns right now mm -hmm. and global warming as well. So That's we're still great. busy. Yes, keep busy. That's great. <laughs> yeah, but each issue, each issue has their own conundrums of how to um, how to uh, talk to those people, you know. But the evolution, we felt that we wanted to, we we wanted just each individual female role model to just say what they wanted in front of the camera, and then we'll just put it put it out there. And you can view all. You can view all of their. Um, original videos unedited on the YouTube channel for Scope. Right. I, I can't remember what it, what the Scope Science maybe YouTube Scope Science. But if you look for the the video, you'll find the channel, um, and you can view all of their unedited videos. And and they were all fine with that. And so um, everything's out in the open. <laughs> I, I think that's great because then if somebody is into the whole the whole idea here is you want to get somebody interested and if somebody right. who wasn't interested becomes interested they want to delve deeper and so if they right. if they want to then they can and they can and they can learn more and hear more from each of the people if if they choose to so right and that's why we threw make it up available. a couple resources um, for the National Center for Science Education and then the National uh, I think it was National Science Foundation has a, a, a resources for evolution for learning about evolution we threw those um, links up on our YouTube page for people to learn more um, so we don't know if this is going to be a way to convince people, but we really, we really felt strongly that need a positive message from um, the correct role models. You know, going back to what I was saying before about the biodiversity messaging. You know, uh, maybe we need less stuffy white uh, old people, and maybe we need we need a better diversity um, of people out there. And we need less people that look like me <laughs> and more people that look like you and others out um, out there talking. So, uh, and, and being more visible. Well, I thank you so much for joining me today on the show. We got started a little late, but I think the show no ended up great. The video problems that we had didn't, didn't seem to, to stick with us <laughs> for the actual show. So I'm glad that we made it through. Um, Kevin, thank you so much for joining me today. It's been really great talking with you. I hope that Thank you so much for having me. It's been my You're pleasure. Welcome. Great. I, I hope that I can get you back on at some point. Um, if Always. anyone is in, 
if anyone's interested in delving more into idea uh, questions of biodiversity, uh, you can go to the Evo Eco Lab at Scientific American blogs scientific American dot com um, to find the article that we were referencing throughout the show and additionally um, the deepseanews.com if you want to get more deep sea news um, Kevin also you have a bunch of social media you're you're big in the social media stuff we have Twitter is K Zelnio K Z E L N I O anyone who's interested there I know you're also on Google Plus yeah. and um, you have a uh, blog homepage zelnio.org so yeah. anyone anyone who is interested you can check out all of those different resources and that does it for the show thanks a lot Kiki. thank you kevin i'm dr kiki and this has been dr kiki's science hour uh next week we're going to be talking about the world of geology yes the world of geology so i hope that you will join me to talk about the earth under our feet. And until then, you can follow my sciencey pursuits on Twitter. I'm Dr. Kiki. Facebook, I have a Dr. Kiki Facebook page. I'm Kiki Sanford on Google Plus. My uh, blog is drkiki.tv. And where else you can go? Oh, if you want more shows, you can subscribe or visit, subscribe to Dr. Kiki Science Hour in iTunes. You can go to twit.tv slash kiki for past episodes. And uh, there's also twist.org. This Week in Science is a, another news and fun show and a reverent look at the science news with Justin Jackson. Uh, that's every Thursday at 7.30 p.m. here on the Twit Network as well. And you can catch those shows on iTunes or at twist.org. You can email me, drkiki at drkiki.tv or use one of those social media methods to get a hold of me. Ah, thanks for tuning into my science hour. This has been a fun show. All I ask is one hour a week. Remember, one hour a week makes your world a whole, lo whole lot, a whole lot. Yeah, a whole lot more interesting. Thanks for watching. And in the meantime, now it's time for your science meditation of the week. And that was a mimicking octopus being mimicked by a fish. So we have meta-mimicry going on there.